This is part two, two approaches to citizenship. Quote, the Negroes of the country are meeting the growing discrimination against them in two ways, out of which have grown two great parties. Both are led by able men and both are backed by newspapers and magazines, unquote. Thus did the renowned journalist Ray Standard Baker in 1908 posit the difference in approach to achieving full citizenship between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. These are not the only ways African Americans sought to, quote, vouchsafe their rights, unquote, but they form two poles of response that has dominated American racial policy through the 20th and into the 21st centuries. The first approach under consideration might be called accommodationism, which I'll explain in a moment. We identify accommodationism with Booker T. Washington, who is the founder and first principal of Tuskegee Institute in Tuskegee, Macon County, Alabama. Washington's biography provides insight into how he developed his accommodationist philosophy. He was born enslaved on a Virginia plantation in 1856. After emancipation, his family moved to West Virginia, and he worked at physically difficult jobs there, salt factories and coal mines, to earn enough money to attend Hampton Institute in Virginia, then Wayland Seminary in Washington, D.C. Like many of us, he worked his college career, too. In 1881, his Hampton professors recommended him to become the founding principal of Alabama's Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute. After he purchased a plantation for the site of the expanded campus there, students set to work making bricks, raising buildings, farming, and doing all the chores necessary to support the school and its population. Work and economic self-sufficiency were hallmarks of Washington's philosophy. To support the college, Washington worked very closely with white philanthropists and Tuskegee board members to raise funds for Tuskegee and for black education in general. One example of this is his work beginning in 1912 with Julius Rosenwald, chairman of Sears, the giant mail order retailer, to help build schools and libraries for black communities. These are still called Rosenwald schools and many of them still stand. Washington's Atlanta Compromise speech delivered at the Cotton States and International Exposition in Atlanta in 1895, articulated his philosophy. He called on African Americans to stay in the South and to stay on the farm to, as he said, cast down your buckets where you are. He meant blacks should accommodate themselves to the political realities around them and work to create material conditions that would mark them as fit for first-class citizenship. He emphasized, quote, moral and economic improvement, unquote, and according to Ray Standard Baker in 1908, he wanted blacks to exercise responsibility and duty rather than demand rights. Though, quote, from Ray Standard Baker again, he does not advise the Negro to surrender a single right, but to use fully every right they have, unquote. This is to say that Washington believed blacks would gain civil rights by making themselves economically significant and that manual labor, not professional education, was the key. This and mutual aid would uplift the race, as he said, into respectability. Washington promoted black business and was the founder and longtime leader of the National Negro Business League. He enjoyed extraordinary standing among African Americans in the early 20th century, though others, usually urban northern blacks, vehemently thought he was wrong. Newspapers such as the New York Age supported him and relentlessly criticized political agitation by blacks, accusing activists of drawing the color line themselves. Also, the Philadelphia Current and the Chicago Conservator supported Washington's gospel of work, self-help, and general racial uplift. A few years ago, in a quick conversation with me, Professor Chad Williams suggested that Washington might better be understood as a moderate black separatist rather than as an accommodationist, which the moniker was applied to him first by W.E.B. Du Bois. This conversation was too short. My subsequent research and thinking about it uh, this idea too shallow for me to come to any conclusions. 
as is this lecture, too shallow and short, but I wanted to end it before the term itself ended. But keep this idea of uh, Washington as a black separatist in mind when we talk about Marcus Garvey. Washington's chief opponent was W.E.B. Du Bois. Born in Massachusetts after emancipation and 13 years Washington's junior, William Edward Burkhart Du Bois suffered much less racial discrimination and poverty. Though his father left and his mother was a domestic worker, he was able to secure a good education first at Fisk University in Nashville, then he did graduate work at the University of Berlin. He became the first African American to earn a doctorate from Harvard. He did work when not enrolled, usually as a summer school teacher. He became a historian and economist, but was principally a sociologist and was a prolific author and researcher. During our period, he had two significant jobs, as a professor at Atlanta University and as the editor of the NAACP's magazine, The Crisis, from 1910 to 1934. This information I'll repeat in some later slides. Du Bois' position was that blacks should agitate for equality and demand equal rights. However, it took him a while to come to that conclusion. Immediately after Washington gave his Atlanta Compromise speech in 1895, Du Bois praised it. But within a few years, influenced by the 1899 lynching of Sam Hose in Georgia and his own research on the black underclass in Philadelphia, Du Bois began to critique Washington. In an essay Du Bois published in 1903, he called for what he and others before him had called the talented 10th to lead the race. These were highly educated black men who could act as what we would now call public intellectuals and lead African Americans to betterment. Thus does his ideas of education differ from Washington's. Du Bois didn't disparage manual training or grassroots attainment, but emphasized the roles of the classically educated exemplar and leader who could be uncompromising in their agitation for rights. The apogee of his talented 10th ideas came in his 1905 founding of the Niagara Movement by both Du Bois and his supporter, William Monroe Trotter. This was to be a national group with state chapters to agitate for civil rights. The Niagara Movement issued a declaration of principles that asked specifically for manhood suffrage and equal treatment and called upon the black community to suppress vice and to uplift the race through improved education, as well as adopting middle class respectability in things like home life. Washington opposed the Niagara Movement. And in a 1907 split between Du Bois and Trotter, doomed it. This hurt what Baker had called the Radical Party by removing Trotter's newspaper, the Boston Guardian, from support, and it opened a space for Washington supporters to dominate the black community. With the Springfield, Illinois riots of 1908, white and black activists met in New York the following year and formed the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. This absorbed the remainder of the Niagara Movement and, because they generally agreed on goals if not tactics, paved the way for reconciliation with Washington supporters after he died in 1915. Whites, the Du Boisist and the Washingtonites, under the same umbrella, made the NAACP the preeminent civil rights organization in the United States, which really isn't saying much until after World War II. The principal tactic of the NAACP was lawsuits against unjust statutes. In 1910, Du Bois left Atlanta University to become editor of the NAACP magazine, The Crisis, which gave him significant power to articulate his vision of civil rights work and racial goals until he left the editorship in 1934.